Christine Catherine Roosh has written and co-written a number of novels in many different genres, from sci-fi and fantasy to mysteries and romance. She also served as the editor for the magazine for fantasy and science fiction from 1991 to 1997, winning a Hugo Award in 1994 for Best Professional Editor. The New Rebellion is her first and only Star Wars book. And while the Wikipedia page on the novel claims that it was a USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestseller, I couldn't find any evidence that it made the New York Times bestseller list for any of the weeks after it was released. So my memories of this book. When I read The Crystal Star, I felt like something was missing. I said to myself, wasn't there a part where Han goes to a smuggler place and he eats in a cafeteria? Well, it turns out that I had somehow conflated The Crystal Star and The New Rebellion together because The New Rebellion does have a scene where Han goes to a cafeteria and eats smuggler food. So all in all, I misremembered Han's plot line here. I vaguely remembered Luke's and I had completely forgotten everything else. And for the Princess Leia costume count, in the very beginning, during the Senate bombing, she's wearing her white New Hope dress again. She also wears that at the very end. But most of the rest of the time, she's wearing one of Han's old shirts and fatigue pants. So I guess this is casual Leia. So a brief summary. Suddenly, somewhere in the galaxy, millions die. And Luke and Leia are left wondering what exactly has happened. So while Leia has to deal with an assassination attempt, upheaval in the Senate, and allegations against Han, Luke heads off in search of one of his former students who he believes was involved. So I have to say props to Roosh that all the different characters are going off and doing different things, but I didn't feel like they were needlessly fractured, and I also didn't feel like they were sent off on missions that didn't make any sense. Leia's dealing with a bunch of diplomatic stuff, and then she heads off to rescue Luke with Wedge, which, yeah, I can see her doing that. Han goes off to talk to smugglers, makes sense. Lando takes off after Han because he thinks Han's in danger, and Luke is questioning a former student of his and sort of doing the force investigation side here. And then R2 and 3PO even get their own little subplot where they're uncovering the mystery behind the bombing. And I like Leia's arc here. They've recently decided that former Imperials can be elected to the Senate, and a lot of them have been elected, and Leia doesn't know how she feels about that. And when there's a bombing in the Senate building, her first instinct is to blame them. I liked how she was trying to work through all this, basically, that as the New Republic grows and develops, that yeah, you're gonna have to start admitting people in who maybe don't have the same viewpoint as you, and you're gonna have to work to form coalitions and get things done. I do feel like there wasn't a lot of progress on this front. Leia had this issue, she was trying to deal with it, but then it sort of gets sidelined by her tearing off after Luke and Mon Mothma sort of brings it up at the very end, but it's literally the last chapter. You can't get much resolution or development at that point. I also, for the most part, liked Han's plotline. He's contacted by an old smuggler buddy on Coruscant who's warning him that something's going on. Han heads off to Smuggler's Run, runs into a bunch of his old smuggler buddies. <laughs> the weird thing though is that in each of these books so far, every time we run into old smuggler buddies, they're different. And I'm sure that Han has met many different smugglers over his <laughs> smuggling career, but it is a little strange that every time it's a different one and he's like, my best pal! <laughs> uh, how many friends did you have, Han? Especially because these acquaintances at Smuggler's Run definitely don't seem to be his friends. They don't have his best interests at heart. They don't like him. And a few of them outright try to kill him. We also have Lando. When he finds out the Han's in danger, he takes off because he doesn't want anything to happen again, like what happened at the end of Empire, where his friends were betrayed partially because of him and he feels horrible about it. So even though he knows that to go to Smuggler's Run is a very bad idea for him, he goes. He's caught by the glottal fib. 
who seems like a cross between a crocodile and a dragon. He has to tread water for a very long time. Longer than I think Lando probably could tread water because he is older than Han and Han in turn is older than Luke and Leia, but Luke is once again going away from the Jedi Temple for long periods of time. I know he has other teachers, and I'm very glad he has other teachers because he really does not spend much time at the Jedi Temple at all. He's there, he's teaching a group of young students when he feels millions of people perish. And it's just like that moment again in A New Hope when Alderaan was destroyed. So he heads to Coruscant because he also felt that Leia was in danger, and that's the Senate bombing. And then he senses that Brachus was involved, so he heads off to track down Brachus, talks to Brachus, and then Brachus sends him to another one of his failed students who is now on the dark side. <sighs> Luke's Jedi Academy hasn't been running for very long at this point. I believe that the New Rebellion takes place 13 years after the Battle of Endor. So if Luke formed the Jedi Academy seven years after Endor, that means that it's been in operation for only six years at this point. And we've had an astonishing number of students who have left and fallen to the dark side. It makes me a little worried about Luke's track record and teaching skills and maybe that should be best left to someone else but also maybe there's just lots of potential Jedi fall into the dark side and maybe that happened all the time in the prequels and while I'm not fond of Luke the Superman character I'm also not fond of Luke being injured so that he's weakened in some way and then the fights are harder. In this case when he goes to Mist to talk to Rackus ends up talking to Brachus's mother. He's attacked by giant pink bubble creatures who I guess are like jellyfish, but they like burn your skin off. So Brachus's mom had to put him in Bacta and he's already not operating at 100%. And then when he's coming up in the Almanian system and he decides he's gonna check out the moon herder, he's in one of the new X-Wings, which we have learned has a detonator in it. And apparently the way you trigger the detonator is try to do a manual landing. So his X-Wing blows up, breaks his ankle, he's got burns all going down his back. He's in bad shape. So when he finally faces off against Cooler, the bad guy, he's like maybe not even operating at 25% capacity. It just feels like a cheap trick that instead of seeing Luke at his full power or even a more realistic Luke, we have to weaken him to make this fight seem more eventful and dangerous than it really is. Barbara Hambly did a similar thing in Children of the Jedi and I wasn't fond of it but I dislike what Roosh did here even more. Just that weak Luke who's always worried he's gonna die is not a particularly interesting Luke. I did like that Wedge, while still a general, was actually doing his general job, being in charge of the little tiny fleet and moving it. I'm just surprised that it took him so long to figure out that Weller ships were controlled by droids and that he lost so many of his people before this happened. I like that Roosh brought Talon Card and Mara Jade back into it, but they don't really feel like themselves. When the wild card shows up during the battle, Wedge is like, oh, this wild card ship, I don't know whose it is. But surely Wedge has met Card at this point. He knows that the wild card is Talon ship. Also, the wild card is described as a space yacht, and I, I don't think it is. And then Mara doesn't quite seem like herself. There's a bit where Han says, well, she was an Imperial, and but I, I don't trust Imperials. Like, God. This again, she's just sort of there, vaguely snarky, concerned about Luke. I don't know if this is trying to set up the stuff with them in the Hand of Thrawn duology, but I like her presence, but she doesn't really feel like herself. Brachus, Luke's former student who left, first appeared in the second Young Jedi Knights book, Shadow Academy, in September of 1995 and he perished over Yavin 4 in September 1996's Jedi Under Siege. So this is his first adult book appearance. We get a lot of the background behind him, which is interesting. He's an interesting person. Like 
Mara Jade and some of the other Imperial agents. He was taken from his mother at a very young age, trained up to be an operative, and he's never known anything else. He was sent to infiltrate Luke's Jedi Academy. Luke knew he was an Imperial, but he also was strong in the Force, so Luke wanted to see if he could save him. He was there for several years. I, Jedi, which will come out in the spring of 1998, places him in the first class at the Jedi Praxium. So I assume that he's one of the unnamed students from Anderson's trilogy. And after several years at the Jedi Academy, Luke gives him something sort of like the cave at Dagobah, where he has to face himself. But Bracus can't face himself. It terrifies him. He leaves, goes back to his Imperial bosses, leaves them, and then somehow falls under Queller's sway. He just doesn't really want any human interaction at this point. He doesn't want to use the Force. He's not the Brachus that we'll see in the Young Jedi Knights books. He's just broken and sad. Weirdly enough though, he's also really attractive. Like multiple people talk about how attractive he is. Cole Fardreamer says that like, we just saw two attractive people recently and it was Brachus and Princess Leia. And I'm sort of rolling my eyes at Brachus the Ken doll. And then we have Queller slash Dolph, our big bad. He was another one of Luke's students who found out his family had died, left the academy, and just uh, goes bunkers dark side. He blames Leia and the New Republic for what happened to his family. So he wants to dismantle the New Republic and then rule it himself. He also has some dubious force abilities. First of all is that he's killing people because it makes him more powerful. Okay. And then he's able to block Luke and Leia's like force sense of others, which I guess has precedent because it was what Hethrer was doing to the Solo kids in the Crystal Star, but it's another force skill that I'm not super fond of. I just question why everyone feels like Queller is such this huge threat, like he's the emperor again. And then we have this actually pretty good moment when after he's killed, they remove his death head's mask and Leia goes, oh, he was just a boy. He like, still has his baby face, probably wore the mask so he was more frightening. It's just hard for me to see him as this huge threat, knowing at the same time that he's also just a young adult. And then on the droid plotline, we meet Cole Fardreamer, who is a mechanic from Tatooine. In a way, he's very reminiscent of A New Hope's Luke. He's a viewpoint character, and we find out his story that he wanted to be just like Luke Skywalker until someone told him, well, he, you know, he can use the Force. But he still joined up with the New Republic, and he grows to really like R2 and 3PO, and the three of them uncover the whole droid bomb threat. I guess my issue though with the droid bomb threat is that Queller uses it to bomb the Senate. That's also how he's able to take out worlds. And then he goes at the end like he's going to blow up all the droids everywhere. It's going to be this mass holocaust. But the only droids that have this detonator are droids that have been constructed in the last two years. Would there really have been that many droids around <laughs> enough to cause some such mass devastation. I can understand the Senate bombing because yes, a lot of the senators probably do have new top model droids, but I feel like on a whole in the rest of the galaxy, I'm not sure how much damage it would have really done. And it all ends up being moot because R2-D2 is somehow able to turn off the detonator on the droid factory planet. I also felt like the timeline didn't really mesh up very well with this one. We're told that it is one year after the Black Fleet crisis, but that seems like too short an amount of time. Dolph left the Jedi Academy because his parents were killed when the Jahar were just killing a bunch of people on Almania. They sent a message to the New Republic, but they couldn't respond because the Black Fleet crisis was going on. So somehow in the span of one year, Dolph has become Queller. He has all this dark side abilities, very strong. And then the bomb plot has been going on two years. 
And when Luke talks to Bracchus, Bracchus says that he left before the eye of Palpatine, before meeting Callista. But then on the other hand, Luke said that Bracchus was there for several years. The eye of Palpatine and the Callista events in Children of the Jedi and Darksaber happened about a year after the formation of the Jedi Academy. So I just, I don't understand how this meshes up. We also have Leia being threatened with removal from her office, which was exactly what happened in the Black Fleet crisis a year ago. I, I'm not sure how highly I can rank her presidential career if one time they're threatening to kick her out and then just a year later they're threatening to kick her out again. It also seemed like the insinuations that Han was involved with the Senate bombing were so flimsy that I can't believe this was a viable reason for Leia to do anything. Basically the ex-Imperials in the Senate somehow found the message that Lando found had been sent that implied that Han was involved. Leia's like, no, that can't be. And then just like, that's it. We don't hear any other side. She's in danger of being removed from office. So she steps down and lets Mon Mothma take over and she heads off to Almania with Wedge. I would have thought that something like that would have needed more proof than just one randomly intercepted message because that looks very suspicious to me. It looks suspicious to Leia, but apparently it didn't really look suspicious to anyone else. I also felt like the pace was good. It was moving, moving, moving. And then we got to like the final showdown at Almania. Moved so fast. Things didn't totally make sense there. Han and Mara Jade show up with Isla Miri. Isla Miri get eaten by the giant white creature that has befriended Luke. All of a sudden Luke and Queller are like, ooh, like, like, oh. And while this is going on, Mara or Han or Chewie don't make any effort to try to shoot Queller. Meanwhile, that's exactly what Han tried to do in The Last Command when he showed up and Chaboth was like trying to kill Luke and Mara. Instead, it's like Leia uses the force to get the blaster from Han and she's the one that shoots Queller, which I liked her shooting him. I just didn't understand why Han and Mara and Chewie didn't try beforehand. And then the way the Isla Miri affect anyone force sensitive just seemed wrong to me. From the Thrawn trilogy, the sense I got was that you can't use the force, but it doesn't affect your other senses in any way. But in the New Rebellion, when Mara's under the effect of the Isla Miri, the color in her face is off and she's like looks woozy. And then when Luke and Queller and Leia come under the effects of it, it's like they, they can't move right and they feel like, oh, my lightsaber's so heavy, which is not the sense that I got from previous books at all. There just wasn't enough resolution for me. Things happened really fast. And then the last chapter was basically just, yeah, everything's okay. And Cole Fardreamer, we're going to make sure that everyone knows that he uncovered this plot. And, and Leia, you need to work with the former Imperials. And then it just ends like Luke's been in a back to tank. I don't know, needed a little bit more resolution here. So in short, I thought that the New Rebellion started really well. I liked the general plot lines that all the characters followed. But by the time it got to the end, it just didn't work as well for me, mostly because of the way that things just didn't mesh right. And also the way that it took things from previous books and then just either misinterpreted or reinterpreted them. And I don't 100% agree with them. But it was still a fun read and I'm glad I reread it. So next time I will be reading the final book in the Black Fleet Crisis Trilogy by Michael P. QB McDowell, Tyrant's Test.